Truth Matters with S.J. Thomason. Have you ever wondered why many modern scholars date the Bible much later than traditionally believed? I've been examining the reasons behind their hypotheses, which has led me to conclude that they're biased and these scholars hold presuppositions on biblical prophecy. They date Daniel to the second century before Christ, since Daniel predicted Antiochus Epiphanes' reign in the second century. Daniel was actually written by the author Daniel in the sixth century BC during the Babylonian exile. They date Isaiah to the fifth century BC or later, due to Isaiah's specific predictions of King Cyrus, the rise and fall of Babylon, and the fall and rebuilding of the Jewish temple. They also date Moses' Pentateuch to Isaiah's time or later due to its inclusions of prophecies. Starting around the 17th century, Western scholars denied Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch due to the theological implications of its prophecies and the sophistication of its laws. They proposed an evolution in religion from simplistic worship of animals and the sun and moon to a more sophisticated monotheistic belief system. Modern archaeology has largely debunked this argument, as noted by Colin Smith in a critical assessment of the Graf Wellhausen documentary hypotheses. The foundation that supports their post-exilic authorship claim is their belief in only the natural and rejection of true divinely informed prophecies. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Leviticus, or what's known as the Pentateuch, or the Torah, if you're looking at Jewish terms. He wrote this book during the Exodus. Orthodox Jews believe this occurred around the 13th century BC. Ben Shapiro has confirmed that. Christians vary. Some believe he wrote the books in the 16th century BC, while others, such as David Falk, hold to the 13th century BC dating. As David Falk has pointed out, archeology span supports the 13th century BC dating. But what did God say? God told Moses to write the scriptures in Exodus 34, 27. And the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for in accordance with these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Jesus referenced Moses in John 5, 46 to 47, quote, for if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Moses' books include prophecies of the future exiles of the 10 northern tribes of Israel under the Assyrian Empire around the 8th century BC, and the two southern tribes of Judah in the 6th century BC under the Babylonian capture. Since many atheists recognize the divine implications of these fulfilled prophecies, they claim authorship postdates the events. The documentary hypothesis is an example. This hypothesis proposes that multiple authors wrote the book over the centuries, and of course, all of the writings come after prophetic events. And I have proof, which I am going to offer you in just a moment. But before I do, be sure to go to this video and other videos that I've had with Dr. David Falk. He's an Egyptologist. He knows his documentary hypothesis quite well. He knows that hypothesis well, and he's debunked it very well. He debunks it uh, because he knows the ancient languages and he knows the source text. He knows all of that kind of stuff, and he has multiple reasons for debunking it. And so be sure to go watch that video. So let's look at an example of an exilic prophecy. Deuteronomy 4, 26 to 29, and also you can compare that with Deuteronomy 29 and 30. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. So Julius Wellhausen built upon a number of other scholars' research to bring up to to go after the documentary hypothesis. He he studied other scholars and then he crafted his version which 
was popularized. And here's what he said. Here's how this particular scholar came to his conclusions. Look at the way that he searched hard and deep for the evidence. Look what he said. At last, I took courage and made my way through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and even though Noble's commentary to even through Noble's commentary to these books. But it was in vain that I looked for the light which was to be shed from this source on the historical and prophetical books. On the contrary, my enjoyment of the latter was marred by the law. The law, in other words, Deuteronomy. It did not bring them any nearer me, but intruded itself uneasily, like a ghost that makes a noise indeed, but is not visible and really affects nothing. Even where there were points of contact between it and them, differences also made themselves felt. And I found it impossible to give a candid decision in favor of the priority of the law. At last, in the course of a casual visit in Göttingen, in the summer of 1867, I learned through Ritchell that Carl Heinrich Graf placed the, later, the law later than the prophets. And almost without knowing his reasons for the hypothesis, I was prepared to accept it. I readily acknowledged to myself the possibility of understanding Hebrew antiquity without the book of Torah. You see how that works? <laughs> That's not how you're supposed to do scholarship. It is a surprise this man is working in a university. Here is another 19th century scholar, Dr. A. Kunin, who wrote The Prophets and Prophecy in Israel and Historical and Critical Enquiry. Okay, so let's look at how he has come up with support for uh, the versions, these theories that basically rejects the traditional dating. Let's take a look at what he says. Before we do that, we're going to look at uh, what he has supported here, I should say, in the book of introduction, the introduction to the book. And I'm going to talk from what Jay Muir said that was part of his book. Okay, so let's start with that. So he, uh, this, is, this is part of it. Professor Kunin is already known to the English students of theology by the translation of his Religion of Israel, which has recently been published, 1873. In that work, the rise and development of the Hebrew religion is treated at length and with great ability from the point of view of the most advanced modern criticism. The object of the work of which a translation is now offered to the public is more limited, as although it embraces a sketch of the history of the Hebrew ideas regarding the deity, it is mainly concerned with a survey and examination of the phenomena connected with prophecy. It will be seen from the author's preface under what circumstances he undertook the preparation of the treatise. It had become important in the existing condition of biblical criticism in this country that the prophets and their work should be made the subject of a special investigation and be exhibited in their true light. It is well known to all persons interested in theology that the alleged fulfillment of the predictions contained in the prophetical writings of the Old Testament is one of the principal proofs by which the divine origin and infallible authority of the book of which they were form a part are regarded by modern apologetical writers of the Orthodox school as being established. The knowledge of the future, which prophets displayed as such, they maintain as could not be explained on natural principles. It is too precise, detailed, and manifold to have preceded from human foresight or calculation and can only be accounted for on the supposition that it has been derived from a supernatural source. The possessors of such miraculous knowledge must therefore, it is concluded, have been the inspired messengers of God, and all that they uttered in their prophetical capacity must be considered as bearing the stamp of divine authority. And since among other prophecies we find numerous and manifest predictions of a future Messiah who is to appear among the Jews, their writings furnish us with a portion of the evidence on which our belief in the divine origin of the Christian dispensation is founded. As the, these conclusions have never yet, so far as I am aware, been subjected to a thorough and systematic examination, it appeared to be of utmost importance that the grounds on which the supernaturalist views are based by those who maintain them should be considered in detail and that their sufficiency or otherwise to sustain the structure which is built upon them should be ascertained. The results of the investigation instituted with this view by Professor Kunin are detailed in this volume. 
His treatise appears to me to present a clear, complete, and masterly survey of all the branches of the subject the discussion of which is necessary to enable the reader to form a judgment on the great question raised to demonstrate satisfactorily the insufficiency of the grounds on which the supernatural character of prophecy has been assumed and to justify the conclusion that the phenomena can be accounted for without a resort to the supposition of any miraculous intervention by the genius and the peculiar religious character of the Hebrews as developed by their history and fortunes and acted upon by the circumstances of the times in which the prophets lived. An outline of the course of the inquiry will be found in the tables of the contents of several chapters which follow the author's preface. But although a good idea of the line of argument pursued by Dr. Cunin may be obtained, whoops, sorry, may be obtained, where was I here? By this means, it may not be super, superfluous for me to offer another and in some respects more detailed and connected summary of the course and the substance of the author's demonstration of the conclusions at which he has arrived. So what are you seeing here? What did you notice in this passage? You're noticing that they're very, they realize that there's a distinction between what a naturalist can believe uh, and what a supernaturalist can believe. He noticed that people in the, he knows many, many prophecies in the Old Testament. And so because they want to deny those prophecies, they claim that they uh, simply, the authors simply wrote the prophecies after the events. Of course, they wouldn't be called prophets if they wrote the prophecies during or after the events. Plus, Deuteronomy, the law, is drawn from other early texts, such as First and Second Kings, Joshua, and Judges. In other words, those early texts mention Deuteronomy, mention stuff from Deuteronomy. Therefore, Deuteronomy can't have been written after it. Colin Smith says, indeed, as far as questions of dating and authorship are concerned, Deuteronomy is the keystone of the whole documentary hypothesis. Wellhausen and other German scholars of the 19th century considered Deuteronomy a pious fraud that was written during the time of King Josiah, who lived between 640 and 609 BC, by Hebrews to initiate reforms. However, Colin Smith says, the suggestion that the purpose of Deuteronomy was fulfilled in the reforms of Josiah surely underestimates the scope of the Deuteronomic, Deuteronomic legislation and overestimates the scope of the reforms of Josiah. So here's where Second Kings points to Deuteronomy in 2 Kings 22, 8 to 11. And Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And Shaphan, the secretary, came to the king and reported to the king, your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have oversight of the house of the Lord. Then Shaphan, the secretary, told the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book, and Shaphan read it before the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Deuteronomy also debunks liberal treatment of the text and this idea of this continuous redaction process through centuries. He, it does it right here, Deuteronomy 4, 1 to 2. And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you, and do them that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord, your God, that I command you. So in conclusion, 19th century advocates of the documentary hypothesis and the late authorship of other Hebrew scriptures often have admitted the assumptions upon which their hypotheses rest. Rejection of prophecy. Modern scholars such as Ulrich Burgess also admit this, and I've posted what he said in multiple other videos. You can go look at my most recent one on the book of Daniel for that. If scholars truly want to seek the truth, they should examine their consciences and try to seek the truth. The documentary hypothesis and modern versions of it haven't disappeared. They're still taught in Hebrew schools. People shouldn't simply accept this scholarship without critically examining its assumptions and a theological leanings. Thank you for your time. If you like this kind of content, please like, subscribe, and do come again. And just remember, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. May God bless you.